of knowledge we'll be sharing tonight. Um, I'm just going to um, put a couple of slides up on the screen for us to get us started. And then we'll be handing the microphone off to Christine and Joshua, who are here to uh, share some of their work with us and answer some of your questions. Does that sound good? Anybody have any questions before we get started? All right. Let's see here. So um, tonight's agenda, I wanted to just quickly go over with you. Um, you hopefully you're in the right place. This is a workshop uh, that CISA is sponsoring uh, from our um, a new annual series that we hope to be uh, starting and kicking off this year uh, around climate adaptation on farms uh, in the areas in Western Massachusetts and surrounding areas. Uh, and this year, the theme is adapting your farm to changing local precipitation patterns, partly based on what uh, so many farmers experienced last summer with the torrential and the frequent downfours that we experienced here in this part of New England. Um, so I'm just gonna go over a few things uh, about the series and other uh, workshops that will be a part of the series. Then we'll hear from Christine and Joshua. Uh, then we'll wrap it up. And we do have a workshop evaluation form uh, that, uh, that we'd like you to complete. And certainly any of you who are farmers or are working with farmers do remember what it was like last summer. And our hopes is that some of the information that we share tonight is going to help all of us to prepare more for these kinds of events happening again. And uh, that's our hope at CISA, that we can start forming a community of farmers and farmer advocates who are really looking at the local micro impacts of climate change and supporting each other to, to prepare. Uh, which will not be easy or, or cheap, I'm sorry to say. Um, so again, this theme for this year is adapting your farm to changing local precipitation patterns here in New England. We're at the series kickoff tonight. Uh, and then over the course of the next four months or so, or five months, we are planning to have on-farm workshops. Uh, and just to explain how we have them set up, we're planning to have um, parallel uh, on-farm workshops, two geared towards small and medium farms. And of those two, one will be about irrigation adaptations and the other will be focused on flooding management uh, adaptations, again, for small and medium. Then we're gonna have the same pair uh, of adaptations for large farms, uh, irrigation and flooding management. And we're hoping that all of you will join us for some of these events and you will be getting, um, you'll be getting information about where they'll be held and the dates they'll be held and how to register and pay because there will be a fee for these workshops. And then we're hoping in the fall to convene another more informal meeting, which we again hope that some of the folks that have come tonight and to the on-farm workshops will join us to reflect a little bit at, towards the end of the growing season and look at how things went and was it necessary to use any of these kinds of adaptations or you know, just how did the year go looking at it through some of these possible uh, adjustments that farms can make. Uh, so that is what we have in store for this year's uh, series. Uh, this series, I just wanna let everybody know if you're not familiar with this new climate program that CISA is building uh, and uh, which I am a part of. Um, we are uh, focusing on the kinds of work that you can see in this slide here, uh, technical assistance uh, on adaptation practices for farms and farm related businesses, providing resources uh, such as grant opportunities of which there are increasing uh, numbers related to climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and we can provide support with writing those grants. Uh, we do manage um, not just through the climate program as an organization, but, but uh, an emergency farm fund program, which periodically provides low in, no interest loans to farms who have suffered losses, most often from climate or weather related impacts. 
Um, we'll be doing more climate change policy and farm advocacy around climate change impacts, workshops such as this, and eventually we hope to be a part of on-farm research and education related to um, preparation and, and addressing climate change impacts. So uh, look forward to working with all of you on these issues in the future as we build our community around uh, responding to the changes. And finally, before we um, get into our topic tonight, I just wanna give you a summary of who's here. You can see a map that shows we have, there were 20 farms registered. I don't think they're all here, but hopefully they'll show up. And if not, they were certainly interested in this, this issue. And you can just see here the distribution with a couple of farms coming from outside of our normal region of work, which is just great. We love to, to build beyond our borders, uh, especially because climate change doesn't know anything about those borders usually. <laughs> uh, so we have 20 farms registered uh, and a total of 2,142 acres represented, which uh, I think is pretty exciting. And also uh, you know, a way to think about how we impact uh, how our work as advocates uh, impacts the landscape. You know, we, we want to get this kind of information out to, to as many acres as we can. Uh, and of those 2,142 acres, um, in the registration form, if you recall, you, we, you were asked to tell us how many acres you had in cultivation, and those were 220. And while CISA generally focuses on those 220 acres, <laughs> we also recognize that farms are part of a bigger landscape and uh, are taking that into account as we, as we help prepare. Uh, of the farms, we're very uh, diverse in the types of crops they grew, tree crops, fruit and vegetables, flowers, herbs, and livestock. And when we asked you, what are some of the problems that you're experiencing? These four were the most frequent too much or too little water and all at the wrong time, <laughs> not what we want. Uh, the costs uh, of adaptation, you know, even costs of actual adaptation practices and things uh, that folks dream of having to do or, or know they have to do, to total food system collapse and, and also massive threats like increased to new pests. So this is what's on your minds and what I hope that um, um, we'll be exchanging on tonight. So with that said, I'm going to turn off my screen and turn the microphone over to Christine Hatch, who's going to be our first presenter this evening. All right. So thanks again for joining us, everybody. And Christine, Stephen, the floor I is think yours. Uh, yeah. Can you uh, let me screen share? Oh, yeah. Hang on a second. Let me do that. Uh, Okay, I'll do the same for you, Joshua. Are you working? Is that now? Uh, hang on. Are you so a co-host? Oh, great. Okay. All right. So can everybody see that now? All right. Terrific. Well, thank you everyone for coming. I know it's uh, gearing up to be a busy time of year and, and it's um, you're probably already exhausted and it's a long day, so I really thank you for taking the time to, to be here and hear from us, and um, and hopefully we can impart some useful knowledge to you, um, and then really engage in a in a question and answer session that's very lively. I'd like to hear from you because I want to know what's going on with you and how we can really be partners in your well being. So, um, so uh, I look forward to that. So I'm going to kind of start by teeing up some of the problem. And I probably don't even need to tell you this because I'm sure that you're aware of what the issues are, but I'll try to give you a little bit of a broad perspective on it. Uh, and then I'll be followed by Joshua Faulkner, who's going to tell you all the magical answers or maybe some of the magical answers uh -oh. <laughs> for how to deal with some of this stuff. But not to raise the bar too high, Joshua. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of thinking about smart solutions to climate change because we are going to be weathering both floods and drought uh, here in New England. Um, so on the left there is a satellite photo from Hurricane Irene in 2011. And over here is a very, very, very sad and dry cornfield in uh, the 2016 drought. Oh, where'd my button go? There it is. All right. So the, the short answer to what causes climate change 
is an imbalance in the input and the output of heat on the surface of the earth such that we have more input, less output, and it creates a total heating on the surface of the earth. There's nothing new here. This is climate science. It's been going on for a very long time. We know that global temperatures are rising. In some areas, they rise faster than others, and uh, that's not equal over the, the surface of the globe. Um, that causes sea level to rise, both due to the expansion of the water as well as the melting of ice sheets. And, but what's, when we start to get down into the local impacts of this, um, those two first uh, points affect the hydrologic cycle um, in ways that do affect our farms and, and our local weather patterns. We also know that the cause is anthropogenic, but we also know that um, probably the, uh, this, a lot of the solutions could also be anthropogenic. And in fact, I think some of the solutions could really be in our farm. So I, I really see a lot of hope in that. So um, here's, the, here's the question. How does uh, the rising temperature affect the hydrologic cycle? So here's kind of a schematic view of the hydrologic cycle. We've got wind, snow, clouds, uh, exchanging water with the ocean. And this is all moving around and it depends on the air and the water and the energy and pressure balance in this whole system. But really the, the short answer to this question is right here in this giant sponge. Warm air holds more moisture. And I think you'll find this is really funny. Joshua has a picture of this exact same sponge. <laughs> so you're gonna see the sponge again. But if you remember nothing else, just remember that warm air holds more moisture. So for every storm that we saw last year, if this year is warmer than last year, that same storm will have more raindrops in it. And that's kind of one of the things that we're seeing with climate change uh, here in the Northeast in particular is just, it warms up and we start to see those same storms drop more water over even the same period of time. So then in, in the broad scale of things, that temperature rises over the ocean, it captures more water, sees surface temperatures increase, and then that additional water is carried inland and dropped onto our storm, onto our landscape. So when we see coastal storms, they tend to have more water in them. They tend to be more intense when they come down. We see more humidity, uh, and that humidity can stick around for longer uh, and cause trouble in, in terms of um, plants drying out and having a nice balance of dry sun and, and uh, nice rain. Um, and then we also see the land surface temperatures increase so we can get, we can get really thirsty faster. And um, we see that the snow covered area decreases and the time that the snow is on the landscape uh, also decreases. So I think of snow on the landscape as a, a kind of a short term storage for water. So you have water bound up in the snow during the winter time. But if we have a lot of melts or if that snow covered area decreases or if the time that that snow is bound up on the landscape decreases, we just decreased that water tower sitting around waiting for spring. So here are kind of the big impacts that we see on the hydrologic cycle in New England. So we see increased quantity and intensity of precipitation. We also see that more of that precipitation is coming in the form of rain instead of snow. And that leads to landslides because as the, landscape, as the landscape gets covered with more moisture and there's more storms on top of storms on top of storms, that background soil moisture condition is high. And so it can't absorb more liquid and it leads to, to landsliding. And that could be on the, the large landscape scale, but it could also be on the small field scale leading to erosion, particularly if you have an area that isn't uh, bound up in roots. And then of course, flooding from below. So if you're next to a river, you could see rivers overflowing and, and those types of, as we have increased urban cover, you'll see that the water that hits the landscape more quickly reaches the river, which more quickly rises and causes flooding in their surrounding areas. So the more, the more impervious surface that we have around, the faster we see those flood waves come and the higher they are when they do come. Um, because each event 
is more extreme, that leads to the increased frequency of events that are that are labeled extreme events. So if the, for the same number of storms, if they're all more intense, more of them bump up into that category of extreme events. And what that means for our roads and our crossings and all of our infrastructure is that when we designed it, we didn't really think uh, that we would have events that size, or we didn't we think we'd have so many events of that size. So we, there, we're now outside the design specification for a lot of these structures. And at the same time, this seems counterintuitive, but we also have an increased likelihood for droughts. And I'll, I'll show you why this happens, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a balance of the hydrologic cycle. So the water doesn't go anywhere. It just gets redistributed in time and space. And so we might have periods where it's a lot wetter and extremely wet, but then at the same time, we also have periods where it's a lot drier and extremely dry uh, to balance that out. So thinking about some of that resiliency, I'm gonna leave a lot of that to Josh uh, to talk about, and I'm sure you will have some ideas that I'd love to hear about as well, but that's coming. So that's kind of a little bit of a, the climate precursor. Um, and I, I probably don't need to tell you because you're more than well aware that both droughts and floods happen in Massachusetts, they happen in New England, and actually they happen with some frequency and, and have done over the, the um, historical record that we have. Um, but how we respond to those with our agricultural practice and water management will, um, we're gonna have to rethink whether or not we're keyed into the regularity that we and predictability that we had before, or whether uh, we're going to be able to be resilient to this kind of new, I wouldn't, I don't even want to call it a new normal because it's not, it's still changing. And so we got to, we got to think of ways that we're going to adapt to what's coming and then the impacts that that'll have on our water resources and, and, uh, and agricultural practice. So you know, when I first moved to Massachusetts from Utah, which is a very dry state, I was, I thought this is the most fantastic thing in the world. It's, it gets like an average of 50 inches of rain a year and it like comes all year long and it's kind of evenly distributed across the year. I thought this is great. It's, it's very even and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's all the time everywhere. And I thought that was just terrific, but um, it doesn't, it isn't staying that way. So we see more, we see more changes. And this, these are some of the changes that we see in our, in the climate of Massachusetts. So most of the moisture is coming up from the, the, the Atlantic there. That's where we get most of the moisture from. When we get those big nor'easters, this is where those are coming from. So those are, those are some of the really big storms that are leading to, to big floods. And those tend to, because they're coming in from the North, they're bringing a lot of moisture with them. They're running into some, some drier, warmer air and dropping uh, their rain over us. Hurricanes tend to come from the Southeast, generally speaking. And then if we get those Northern winds, these are the winds that tend to lead to drought. So uh, there are a lot of resources out there that show um, the historical context for floods and droughts in New England. So I'm just gonna talk about a few of them. So the, here's some of the, this is one picture from the, I'm gonna give one picture from each of the top five here. So these are flood years in Massachusetts. And um, these are the, the top five uh, and number uh, 11 there is pictured here. This is Hurricane Irene. Um, this is up along Route 2 where uh, we had this 900 foot uh, landslide that knocked out Route 2 for several months. And a lot of that sediment ended up down here in Long Island Sound. Um, and these are sediments that hadn't been mobilized since glacial times. So this was a pure glacial deposit that cut loose on this hill slide because that hill was four times wetter than it usually is. So we were the, the antecedent moisture makes a really big difference. And it's that's what's producing some of these unprecedented impacts that we see. So then what's in a flood? Well, a lot of our hazard maps and the FEMA um, flood insurance rate maps are really based on just a pure inundation bathtub type model. Uh, but there's a lot more in a river flood than just water. 
um, you're probably familiar. It's also carrying a whole bunch of sediment and it probably is carrying some woody material and even some debris. Anything that wasn't tied down is gonna go down the river with it. And anything that's being carried in that water gives that water a lot more force and power to do work on the bed and banks, which is to say erode the bed and banks uh, and carry it along with it. So uh, another, another example from uh, Hurricane Irene from up in Vermont is some really fabulous um, uh, helicopter photos from that time. And of course, you could carry some of the, the cropland. You know, we had a corn crop that was just about ready to be harvested there in August, and that was carried along with the flood. Some livelihoods, no doubt, went along with it and were carried along with the flood. Uh, and here's some of it landed. That was the same. I think this is one of those same sports fields. And, and here's, uh, here's where the river left behind some of the stuff that it carried. So rivers move. And we've gotten complacent, I think, by having all of our infrastructure built so neatly over it. And you see the little sign and you drive right over that river every day. But rivers actually naturally move back and forth. And the more we can accommodate that natural movement of rivers and, and stay out of harm's way, the more we can um, not have uh, really major impacts from this kind of erosive flooding from rivers. The other thing that they might move is our roads and bridges. So another, it, it's really convenient to build a road right alongside a nice flat space next to a river, but that's also probably a floodplain. And if the river has a big enough flow, like one of these unprecedented large storms like Irene, then it's probably gonna take that road right on out with it. Uh, and then of course that disrupts all of our uh, transportation network. It disrupts emergency services and it disrupts our ability to get um, the food to market or whatever else we're trying to do. So some of the things that um, farmers have seen out there our, one of our local farmers, Dan Kaplan over at Brookfield Farm, um, thinks about this stuff a lot. And, and I said, well, what are, what are farmers seeing out there? You know, do they see rain? Do they see drought? And he says, we see everything, just more of it. So when it rains, it's more intense. When, it humid, when it's humid, it sticks around for longer. There's more fog in the summer. Longer growing season is kind of nice, but there's also really long dry periods too. So we've always had to react, he says, but now everything we adapt to is more extreme. And I thought that encapsulated it pretty nicely. So some examples from him show um, some excess moisture problems. And these probably look familiar from last summer where uh, that last July, I think most parts of the state had about 300% of normal precipitation uh, and our infrastructure couldn't handle that either. Um, this was a tomato crop that was being sprayed against a blight, and that was a product of too much moisture. So, and then another example on the flip side, of course, are the droughts. And, uh, you know, again, I found it a little hard to believe that we'd have droughts in, in such a, a wet, rainy state like Massachusetts, but sure enough, we've had some big ones. Uh, the largest, of course, was the 65, 66. So this was uh, the Quabbin Reservoir Pump Intake Station. And that drought lasted for a good 10 years total before it got completely re recovered from. And so 2016 was only number 13 on the list. But it's worth noting that of the, of the top five, every single one of these, those, la those middle three, were followed by some uh, water resource legislation in the state to try to protect our water resources and, and manage them a little bit better. So some of the things that can happen from having too little moisture is uh, the plants could be stunted. The, the corn might be starved because it's just not getting enough moisture and the cows don't have enough to eat. So one other thing um, that I think is really interesting about uh, some of the climate patterns that we're seeing, and this one I think is a real bugaboo. And I, this one I really don't know uh, what the best way to solve it is. But this is um, from some recent studies by our, our uh, a climatologist, Michael Rollins. And he's been looking at when do you see the spring thaw advance and when do you see the autumn freeze delay? And, and what are the windows of variability on these shoulder seasons that we see? And it, to my knowledge, and again, I'm, I'm not a farmer, so tell me if I've got this wrong, but I, I think 
the plants get some signals from those time periods. And when you see a shift, the plants are going to kick into gear and do something. And usually when they do something, they want to go for it and do it. They don't want to like go a little and then come back and go a little and come back. It's like they go or they don't go. And when you have these shoulder seasons that this is my little artistic rendition here of <laughs> going up and down, it's really, I think, confusing for the plants. And I think this is where we get blooms that come out and then they freeze again and, and we lose the crop of uh, say peaches or whatever uh, fruit trees are coming out. And, and, and this one's a tricky one to deal with because I think it, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm not really sure what the answer is there. So maybe we can have some discussion around that, but that's some of, of what I think we're seeing a lot more of is these kind of variability right on the, on the shoulder. Um, and so here's some of the adaptations that, uh, that my buddy Dan Kaplan was showing. So they were throwing some plastic down over the strawberries to keep them safe from some of that frost with some help with some kids. Um, and then if there was a snap freeze, they got some of this, uh, some spray hoses and to get ready to, to add a little moisture for protection there. Um, and so then thinking about some solutions. So I, again, I, I probably don't need to tell you this, but this I thought was one of the more um, fulfilling groups that I participated in. We did some, some farmer to farmer talks and it just was really fun to have everyone kind of sit in a room together and they, they were doing um, potlucks once a month and would just travel around to each other's farms, sit and have a meal together and say, hey, what are you doing about this thing? And I think this is kind of some of the ideas that uh, CISO is having here and just to build this network of folks that can talk to each other about, you know, what are you seeing? How are you dealing with that? Um, and, and these guys here are showing them, they're showing each other a little tool that they developed. Well, you know, when things get really wet, well, I've got this little like mini plow and, and they had invented that and like, okay, I'll share my little tool with you and uh, see how it works. Um, so I just found that to be really powerful uh, to see, to, to be in the room with this group and, and, uh, you know, and if there was anything I could offer them, I'm happy to, but I really think so much of the knowledge was just sharing amongst themselves, um, farmers talking to, to farmers. Um, and I feel like, uh, uh, you know, here you are listening to me, but I really think <laughs> farmers will listen to each other much more than necessarily uh, other, other outside folks, just because, you know, you're, you're known and uh, those, this kind of group discussion and understanding can be really powerful. Um, I like the idea of having the social interaction first, just to kind of um, build some some momentum and trust there. And then once you're once you're there, you know, then bring some experts in on a topic that you all find uh, is is really the the topic of interest. Um, and then just that that all knowledge is valuable. Um, that you know the on the on the ground knowledge is is equal to. The, any knowledge that comes from anywhere else, because, you know, even if one person is spending all the time with the numbers, they don't see what it looks like being out there in, in real time. Um, and so there can really be a nice two-way street to that, to that dialogue. Um, so, yeah, I like that idea of eating together, talking together and, and getting results. Um, and, and I wanted to throw this up here. I don't know if uh, we want to talk about any of this later, but um, there's a, a number of kind of resources that might be useful for seeing some of these things in real time. So these are just some some resources, and I'll make this presentation available if you want it. And this is uh, mapping stream flow data and also where things are in flood or drought stage. Um, there's the the uh, drought early warning system, which for some reason isn't on here, but that's uh, the other one that I really like is on there. Um, and then I'll just in a as a means for transitioning over to to Joshua end with this kind of litany of exactly what these kinds of of impacts to um, Massachusetts agriculture might be from the changes that we see in climate. So those average and seasonal air temperatures are increasing. We see shifts in time in the seasons, so the lengthening of the summer season, but also uh, later, uh, that moving forward of the, of the thaw happens a little bit later. Um, the number of hot days and hot nights increases. Precipitation patterns are changing. So we see more rain. The rain comes later. Um, the, uh, high, the increasing CO2. So, you know, you probably hear a lot about that. We got to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere. 
but some of the plants really like it and they grow really fast. Um, the, those extreme precipitation events are tricky because they can actually be uh, really powerful and percussive and can damage the crops and erode the soils. And then not to mention watch out, wash out the infrastructure around. Um, and then increases in flood damage, particularly for those farms that are adjacent to, uh, to any kind of rivers or waterways is expected along with severe wind and storm hazards. Um, and then the soil moisture uh, is, total soil moisture is predicted to increase in spring, but decrease throughout the summer months. And, th and this is, that last one is one that, I, that could pot potentially be addressed with burying some of that organic material in the soil. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to start a Q&A. So if you, if you have any question, you can just unmute yourself and talk to Christine, feel free. I'm just gonna lead with a question here, Christine, kind of a, a dystopian question. But if we look at the models that are showing us how the precipitation patterns are changing and we look out 50 or 100 years, this intensification that we're seeing is will continue to intensify over that period of time uh, yeah, under most scenarios of reducing greenhouse gas emissions at this point, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, the maybe the yeah, I, I think in general that's that's pretty much true. And I don't know if there's it's a, the system is elastic, so it's a little bit hard to predict if that's just a unidirectional trend. But it's uh -huh. certainly the trend that we've we've already seen for the last 50 years and the one that we're likely to see for the next 50 before we start to hit that crest and head back down the other way if we if we're able uh -huh. to do the right thing now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. And it is interesting though, because we have seen that trend in both in groundwater coming up over the last 50 years, as well as generally the, the precipitation totals creeping up little by mm -hmm. little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Christine? Is that Northeastern Climate Hub still meeting this year? Are there plans to keep that going? I think there is some action there. Josh may actually be more involved with it at the moment than I am. Massachusetts has kind of like gotten quiet <laughs> with the Climate Hub, but I think so. Josh could probably answer that. Yeah, they they're they're still around. Um, they still have an active coordinator, Aaron Lane, um, and they were pretty quiet actually during the, I don't you know during the previous presidential administration, and now they're starting to rebuild themselves, um, and actually have a few grant programs that they've launched, and I, I expect within the next year we'll we'll start to see more of. Um, their products kind of filtering through the universities and and their website being built out a little more, but they, their their website is very much still there and functioning, and they're still staffed. Yep. And Aaron's fantastic. Yeah, good point. Yep. yep. Other questions or comments? Um, yeah, I was curious about uh, you had mentioned something about um, seeing an increase in groundwater. Uh, in addition to increase in precipitation. Could you speak a little bit more to that? Sure. So there's a number of monitoring wells that are scattered around Massachusetts and in, and in uh, the greater Northeast. And over time, the USGS and others have collected just depth to water in those wells. And, and just watching those levels over time, we see that that base water level is creeping up over time. And so it gets the groundwater is getting closer and closer to the, the land surface elevation with time. So it, it, what people most notice is that they see flooding in their basements. And so they might see it only when there's a big storm, but that maybe that didn't used to happen at all, that sort of thing. So any low lying lands um, might potentially have be more saturated more often just because that water is getting closer to the land surface. Right, thank you.
Other questions or comments for Christine? So I have one more question for you all. Um, if you were to, I have a colleague who works on the global circulation models and has been talking about being able to, to predict a whole range of metrics with pretty good accuracy out to 15 days. If you could have some sort of an indicator of like, is a really big storm coming or am I gonna get a freeze or are we expecting one of these extreme events? Am I gonna get a flash drought? Like, what would the what would the metric be that you would want out 15 days or, or would that be useful to you? I'm kind of I, I have here. another ver version of that question, which is, uh, is it possible to predict rough periods and years of drought cycles and, and flood cycles? My thought is that if we have that warning two or three years ahead of time, there may be better seed varieties uh, mm -hmm. that I mean, one of, one of the problems everybody knows about is that we've, we're losing varieties uh, and we're, we're, we're doing our own version of monoculture. And I'm wondering if, if um, is it possible to say, well, there are going to be three or four years of drought or three or four years of flood or is prediction too difficult at that level? Oh boy, that's kind of the the holy grail, isn't it? <laughs> I don't I don't I don't know that we can say with that degree of certainty. Sometimes when we get socked into a, a a really deep drought, you can sort of know that it'll stick around for a while. Uh, but by then you're kind of already in it. Um I don't think I don't think our prediction is that good. The the best the best indicator that I think would get you close, but it's still based on probability, you know, it's still chance, uh, would be trying to capture some of the, as you're suggesting, the frequency content of the, the repetition of those events. And there've been some studies that try to take that frequency content from the past and then map it on to our increasing temperatures from the present and the future to see if we can get there. And I just, I think they do a better job, but I don't know that they could say, with a degree of certainty that would be useful to you for that kind of forecasting. I guess I was a long way of saying not really. <laughs> um, I, I've talked with a few growers asking them if they'd be interested in, in using the climate smart farming tools that Cornell has developed. And um, the folks that I spoke with were most interested in precipitation just because, you know, I mean, once it's really raining, there's not much you can do about that. But, but in terms of wasting labor on setting up irrigation, it makes a big difference in surviving a drought year. Um, and the other thing they were really interested in was humidity for managing uh, foliar diseases. Oh, okay. I will ask. I'll see if that's one that she can get at. I'm interested, Christine, in how targeted that can be. I, again, think taking off partly from Julie's question, often when you're, you know, when you're waiting for rain in a dry stretch, who, if there is some rain, who gets it can be very variable on a very local level. So I'm curious in those kinds of predictions, you know, how close, how big's the pixel? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 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 Fair question. Okay. I can ask that one too. I don't, I, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Just too fine grained. It, you know, it depends. They've got, you know, some of these models are down, you know, the, 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 the standard model was down to like a 30 kilometer pixel, which is close. It might hit your farm, um, depending on how big your farm is. But if, if we were down to like a five kilometer pixel, now we're talking something that could be really useful. So I don't, I'll see, I'll see how granular that can be. All right, thank you. Any final questions for Christine?
All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. And Christine, are you sticking with us for the rest of the evening? Yeah, I'll stick around. I'm right here. Great. So uh, there might be some questions that come up after uh, uh, Joshua shares his uh, his work with us. All right. So Joshua, you have uh, you can you're a co-host, right? I am. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Steve. All yours. Okay. Let me get my slides up here. All right. Um, I assume you can see those. Let me know if you can't. Um, so great setup, Christine. Thank you very much um, for the kind of uh, really framing the situation for farms in in not just Massachusetts but but New England. I think you know where I am in Vermont and in New Hampshire and Maine, we're facing much of the same. Uh, the same challenges. And, and so that, that is the perspective I bring is kind of the Vermont perspective, but it, yeah, I do believe it, it applies squarely to Massachusetts as, as well. Um, so what I wanted to try to do um, with the foundation that's been, been set is talk about some of the adaptation um, measures that, that farmers can, can take. And I know we have limited time, so I'm going to try to focus on on two one would be drainage when there's when there's too much water um, I'm also going to um, then transition to irrigation and talk about some of the tools we can use some how how good are we managing our water on on farms on veg, veg and fruit farms and New England and then what tools we might be able to use to improve the use of that water um, make it more efficient and then I won't have much time, but I'm going to touch on soil health at the end. And, and Christine did a little bit of that as well. And, and that's really something that kind of addresses both of those conditions, whether it's too much water or, or too little water. All right, so let's, let's just jump right in. So um, this, this too much water thing is, is really, I think, kind of one of the, the headline climate change stories for, for farmers and and that's really, I think, supported by some of the data we have in our New England states. Here's, um, uh, this, is, this is data from the USDA Risk Management Agency just showing a pie of where crop insurance payments are made. And you can see that um, well over half of this pie um, in Vermont is, is due to excess moisture. Um, so that, you know, just, just showing that th this, excess moisture that we're seeing on farms has real impacts on, on economics and, and productivity on our farms. And what I, I think is interesting is when you move out of New England and you look at this, um, you look at this pie for other, other states, maybe in the mid-Atlantic or, or moving westward, this looks very different. Um, all of a sudden that excess moisture piece gets much smaller and that drought piece start, really starts to dominate. Um, so I think this is, you know, we're seeing drought here and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really just this the excess moisture that has everybody pulling their hair out. Um, and so, of course, these, you know, it's not just more rainfall, but it's the patterns that are changing. As, as Christine mentioned, we're seeing more of these extreme events. Um, this is me standing in a cornfield just outside of Burlington, Vermont. And this is this is sweet corn. This isn't field corn on a dairy farm. This is a pretty large vegetable farm growing sweet corn. And this is after just one rainstorm in the summer mm -hmm. of um, 2014. Um, and visited this farm with, with Vern Grubinger. Some of you may know him as our fruit and veg specialist here at, in U, at UVM. Um, but, you know, these, these events have real effects on farms. Um, losing topsoil, which we all know is the, is the foundation of production on our, on our farms. And what I think is interesting is when you travel around and you talk to farmers, we have a lot of, you know, we have um, conventional growers, older, um, you know, kind of uh, been here for generations and generations, and we have a lot of new, younger growers. Doesn't matter where someone's politics are, where they are in acceptance of climate change, everyone acknowledges um, that that the frequency and the intensity of storms is is definitely changing. And then it's it's not just the loss of topsoil from farms; it's it's the loss of really just 
chunks of land from from farms, especially farms in our floodplains. You know, the, this, these soils are we all know our most productive soils, um, very fertile, have uh, been laid down um, for centuries of, of floods, well-drained soils, um, but they're also right in the crosshairs of these flooding events that we're seeing with climate change. Um, this, is a, this is a farmer, Geo Honingford, after, her, after um, Tropical Storm Irene came up through Vermont, um, just and lost, you, you know, um, just a, an entire, um, piece of his of his farmland there in the in the floodplain and you know these farms are really what's critical um, for building our local food system you know we can't just move these fields up onto that hillside in the background um, these these soils and in, in these areas are are essential um, for for farmers in in New England all right so let's talk about some some solutions um, and so for too much water so really we're, we're looking at a couple of things we're looking at intense rainfall that cause storm cause erosion events and i'll address that at the end but then we're also looking at just saturated soils just lots and lots of rainfall saturating our soils causing issues with um with our crops and so drainage is um through time has been the number one way that farmers have have tried to address um, excess moisture. And there's really two big benefits here to drainage. Um, the one is, is probably the most obvious one. We're trying to remove water from the root zone um, so that we don't have yield impact, so that we don't drown those crops and we reduce that year to year variability. So get a farmer off of, a, off of the roller coaster and, and try to get on a nice level flat um, um, road. And then the other one, which is maybe less obvious, but potentially has even a greater impact is that it improves trafficability within the field. It allows the farmer to get into the field and do what they need to do when they need to do it. Um, and I think this is especially important for vegetable growers who are really in the in the fields in the middle of the summertime. You know, it's not just the spring. It's not just in the fall um, like our field crop growers, but they really need to be in the field multiple times throughout the throughout the year. Um, we have we have very little um, data on the economic benefit, the yield benefits of drainage um, in in New England, but this. Uh, figure I'm showing here is from Ontario, probably the closest we can get to New England. And you can see these are field crops, but the um, yield improvements as a result of drainage are, are notable. Um, and then there's a study there I'm, I'm showing on the right hand side of the screen, a finding from a 25-year uh, trial in Ohio where 30% yield increases were seen. And, and again, this is field crops, um, but you know, we did some survey work here in Vermont on tile drainage, and um, it, it clearly showed that vegetable growers were really the number one population in, at least in our state, that was looking at, at drainage to, because, because the crops are such a high value compared to field crops. It's really important to have, have well-drained conditions. Um, drainage helps in the wet years and it helps in the dry years. A lot of folks are concerned that, well, if we, if we drain our land, we're going to be removing water that is potentially can be utilized by that crop when we have a drought. Um, in, in reality, um, drainage actually lowers that water table in the spring so that when we plant our crops, we have deeper rooting depth that that, that water table doesn't prevent roots from going deeper. Um, and then later on in the summertime, um, we have those deep roots when we don't have um, near as much precipitation when we get into those droughty periods. Um, so it helps in the, it helps really in kind of both ends of the spectrum there. How do we drain, how do we go about draining? There's really several different ways. I'm going to start with um, you know, I'm not going to talk about surface drainage today, but that is certainly an option, you know, land leveling and manipulating the surface of the of fields. Um, the other um, thing I'm going to talk about is tile drainage just here in a, in a minute. Um, but I want to start with this, the, the interceptor drain. And this is, um, I think, in terms of bang for the buck, um, really one of the, the best tools we can use, especially in hilly um, where we have, you know, a little bit of topography on our farms. Um, these are ditches, interceptor ditches are 
designed to, to cut off water coming from a nearby hillside before it enters our flatter production area. Um, <clears throat> these can be used for surface water or for groundwater. Um, and I'm just showing a couple uh, cross sections of what these might look like um, on the left. We'll start on the left there. there. There's an image of one and then on the bottom left, um, we're looking at how a surface, how a trench um, dug down into the to the water table depth can can divert surface water in the green and then that um, and then the groundwater in the in the blue, and then on the right hand side of the screen you can see if th this can be done with a perforated pipe as well, um, lowering that that water table. Um, so these are these are very effective, um, and especially if you have a situation where you have water coming from off of the farm onto the farm or off of the field onto the field. Um, these are these are great, um, something might, very worth considering. Um, the last one is, is tile drainage. And this is where there's a lot of attention lately, um, partially because of some of the environmental concerns uh, surrounding this. Um, we're doing a lot of re research on this and, and nutrient transport through tile drains, um, but tile drains are, are nothing new. Um, they have been in one form or another um, been used for for generations on farms, um, and the early ones were were um, hollowed sections of the soil covered with rock and then backfilled over top of. Um, they've also used wooden shape uh, formed um, cavities in the soil with wood, and then we graduated up to the the clay terracotta type tile, which you see there on the left, and now we use the the modern tile. Um, which is that black corrugated pipe. Um, and this is um, widely used on, on crop farms and in um, <clears throat> field crop farms and on, on vegetable farms here um, in, in Vermont. And there's a lot to talk about with tile drainage. I think the, the um, biggest question that you'd want to try to uh, uh, answer for your fields is what's the spacing of tile drainage should be. Um, and there's several ways of going about that. Um, well, first, let me start here on the on the right hand side of the screen. Um, the spacing really affects the 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 time it takes to lower that water table back below the the root zone of your crop. So when you have um, tiles spaced a long way apart from one another, it takes a long time to reduce that water table. And when you have tiles spaced very tightly um, closer together, um, that water table drops much quicker. And you can kind of see that in the schematic there. Um, how do we determine spacing? Several ways of doing that. You can use your state's drainage guide. Um, you can calculate the, the, the uh, correct spacing based upon your soil texture. Um, but what I recommend is talking to other farmers um, or other drainage or drainage contractors that have been installing tile drainage on farms in your area on similar type soils and just finding out what works. Um, we've seen this change quite a bit um, in our area over the past um, 15 to 20 years. Tile drains used to be spaced at 70 feet. Now we're seeing tile drains spaced at 30 to 25 feet um, and they're functioning much better. So, so I recommend talking to others in, in your area um, and seeing what has worked for them. And then it, certainly the investment does increase with the tighter your spacing, it's, it's more labor for the installation, it's more material for the installation. So your, your, finance, your financials should also certainly be considered with that as well. Um, what level of yield loss are you willing to sustain? Um, or do you own this land? Do you rent this land? What's the value of the land? Um, and then go through a, a kind of a, a pretty typical economic analysis um, for draining land. And I can send you some, some links that can direct you on um, that. And you can put in your information and find out what uh, the potential economic um, or what the payback period would be. Um, so those are, um, that's a good place to start, I think, when you're thinking about draining land. Okay. Now with two, so that was too much water. Now I want to transition um, to too little water. It seems like we're moving really fast. Um, <clears throat> so as as Christine mentioned, you know, there's been 
been droughts in New England. Um, they're nothing new. Um, some of the data that we have indicates that we'll probably see more droughty periods. Um, because of the way we're seeing those storms packaged up into really intense events, um, we might be seeing more rain or, this, or in some summers the same amount of rain, but the, the intense events are being interspersed by no rain at all. So we're seeing, you know, instead of the nice gentle half inch or three quarter inch rainfall events, um, you know, that might take a day or so to fall and, and soak our soils. We're seeing more of that happening over a few hours and then maybe it's a drought for a couple of weeks. Um, and those are really difficult to deal with. Um, and even farms, um, there's been some work done in, in New York state that has indicated even farms with existing irrigation um, may struggle with, with drought. And that's because of um, maybe poor design or inadequate systems or lack of um, scheduling technology, uh, whether it's technology or tools um, to, to understand when water should be applied and how much water should be applied. Um, and then loss, certainly we've seen losses in that 2016 drought. I saw some, I couldn't find it um, as I was creating these slides, but some pretty convincing or, or pretty staggering data from Massachusetts that, that indicated how much loss farmers suffered in that 2016 drought. And the same was seen um, in other states. And, and this is just one statistic um, from this sweet paper in, in, in New York where 30% losses were seen by those farmers. And, and, that, and that was out in Western New York. Okay, and we have seen uh, there's some modeling work that shows that irrigation demand will increase um, in time. So more, I think more support for this idea that um, drought is becoming more common. We're going to need to think about um, interventions and, and tools to manage for those droughty periods. This is a, a study that looked at um, what the irrigation withdrawal would expected to be would be expected. Um, in, in the year 2090 um, compared to the year 2005 or what it was in 2000, what it was measured in 2005. Um, so you kind of see that ratio on the y-axis and kind of a funny story here. I, I use this in um, Vermont and I've used it in Maine, New Hampshire. Um, I've never used it in New Ham in, in Massachusetts. And so I was looking for Massachusetts here, somewhere in the middle of the pack there with Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire. And there it was down at the, on the lower right hand corner. And I thought, wow, it doesn't really say Massachusetts is going to need more irrigation water. But then I dug into um, where this data comes from. And this is really derived from, from the large farms. Um, so, you know, no wonder some of the large farms have already installed much of their irrigation infrastructure that's not expected to increase in usage because they're already using it, maybe at capacity, but this doesn't account for the smaller farms. Um, so I think small farms should kind of take this um, Massachusetts data with a little bit of grain of salt and think, yes, we still need to invest in irrigation and, and ways to ensure um, that we can deal with these droughty periods. So I, I want to show some data that we've collected in Vermont, it, you know, kind of thinking about, yes, we're going to need more irrigation, um, but how efficiently are we using our water currently? And so this was a, a couple year study where we um, were, I'm going to show results from one vegetable farm. We did this on a few vegetable farms, um, but we monitored um, the water usage farms were using. And then we built, we calculated how much water the crops were using, um, how much water is being applied in irrigation versus how much water um, the crops are using. And we built this simple water balance to determine whether, oh, we're applying too much water or we're not applying enough water on these vegetable farms. Okay, so the, the first farm we looked at was, um, had 30 and a half acres of mixed veggies, um, very nice soil, sandy loam soils. They had reliable surface water sources um, and they irrigated with overhead irrigation on 26 and a half acres. And then they used drip irrigation on four acres. So we, we separated those drip irrigated acres and those overhead irrigated, irrigated acres um, and did water balances for each of those. And that's what I'm gonna show you here. So on the overhead irrigation, um, we found that, so what we're looking at here, let me, let me start with this, sorry. Um, in, our, in our figure here, um, we're showing how much rainfall 
um, fell on the fields, and that's your red bar, and then how much irrigation was used, um, and those are your blue bars. And so those are, those are positive um, on the y-axis. And then the green kind of um, line that goes up and down, that is the deficit. So that is taking what rainfall and irrigation was applied and subtracting the water that the crops used. Um, and you can see on this farm, almost every week of the year, there's three weeks of the year um, where this farm was not in a deficit, meaning crops were not getting as much water as they needed. Um, and when you sum that up over the season, you see a total deficit of negative 2.6 million gallons. So this farm could have used that much more water on their crops in this, in this overhead irrigation scenario. And remember, this is the bigger field. This is about 26 acre field. Um, and so <clears throat> in total, they ran a deficit of about 100,000 gallons per acre for their wow. overhead irrigation. So pretty substantial. But then when we looked at the drip irrigation fields, we saw the exact opposite. So we're looking at this, the same type of data here where we have our rainfall and our irrigation, subtracting our crop demand, and then we see the deficit there in the green bar. And the, you know, again, the opposite here, almost every week of the year, we see a surplus of water being applied to these crops. So much so that at the end of the season, this, the drip irrigation block, about four acres of drip, um, was over applying by about 92,000 gallons per acre. So the surface fields were under applying by 100,000 gallons an acre, and the drip fields were over applying by about close, pretty close to 100,000 gallons an acre. So results are all over the place. And so what do we do? What, what do we do about this? What do farmers do about this? Because I think this is fairly, rep I would wager this is fairly representative of many farms in New England where water has been a luxury for so long that we don't really think about how we're using it and, and we don't use it near as efficiently as we might be able to. Um, so <clears throat> some of the things farmers that have been in use really in more arid areas of the U.S. for some time um, are soil moisture sensors. And some of our farmers are starting to look at these and, and play with these. And we're starting to do a little bit of research with these as well. Um, and these are um, devices that allow us to simply directly measure um, the soil moisture within the root zone of the crop. Um, there are a couple, couple common options, and I'll, I'll talk briefly about those after this slide. Um, and, but a couple things to, a few things to remember with these. This is not just put one of these in the middle of your, of your field and say that's adequate. We really need to have a few of these to cover different crops, crops that were planted at different times, different soil types. Um, you know, we just need to make sure that wherever we're measuring, we're capturing, you know, what's representative of that crop and not trying to measure here and apply to the field, you know, out behind the barn, um, that it really is very place specific where we use these um, soil moisture sensors. These do require some vigilance. Um, these are manually read. Um, so you need to, you know, be willing to, whether it's you or your, uh, the person on your staff that's responsible for irrigation, making sure crops get their water, make sure they're doing checks on these um, uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, and I think that these are very simple tools, um, but they're very good for making sure that we're with, generally within the ballpark of where we need to be in terms of, in terms of um, irrigating. Um, so our first option is the tensiometer. Some of you may have seen these devices. Um, they're essentially tubes that have a porous ceramic tip on the end, um, and they're filled with a, with a liquid, um, and then they're pressurized, and we insert these into the soil. Um, and if the soil's dry, it sucks water out through that porous ceramic tip. And if the soil's really wet, water goes back into that porous ceramic tip, and the pressure gauge at the top measures how much you know how much pressure is building or how much vacuum is building within that tube and based upon that vacuum we um, can make a conversion to how much water is in the soil and if crops are able to access that water um, these have um, a few pros there's no electronics involved these are just you know kind of nice keep it simple um, they have a very established track record and they're about 70 bucks a unit 
Um, cons are they're they're pretty easily damaged. Um, they do require some some babysitting on occasion, um, and then they are susceptible to frost damage too, which which is something to consider um, for us here in New England. If you forget these leave these out and you, you know, maybe it's not the first frost, but if you have a deep freeze, you might crack these because the liquid within the unit might freeze and, and burst the device. And then our other option are the granular matrix sensors. And, and these are, um, uh, they essentially record a proxy for soil moisture. It's not exactly a direct measurement of soil moisture, um, but we can make a conversion um, to, to soil moisture and, and essentially get a reading that is very similar to that tensiometer I showed on the previous slide. Um, pros of this, um, no O&M required. These, these are just, you know, you just stick them in the ground. They're very durable and they're only about 35 bucks a unit. The cons are you need a reader uh, and it's about 250 bucks to get that reader to read these out. Um, and then I said, some people um, have concerns with these that they're not a direct measurement of soil moisture and tension. Um, but I think they do get us within the ballpark of where we need to be. But if you really want to fine tune your irrigation um, scheduling, this, this might not be the right way to go, but they do have their pros and I think they do get us within the ballpark. Um, and then finally, you know, we have those kind of really simple tools there. And then we have this world of, you know, being able to deploy sensors and look at um, real-time data on your smartphone, on your laptop, and understanding, you know, wiring your sensors up to the, to the cloud, accessing that data wherever you want to. Um, that, that kind of world of technology is just exploding right now. There's lots of options out there. Um, I'm not going to get in-depth on them, um, but the, you know, there are some that we've trialed several of these. Some are great. Some have some challenges um, with all of them. I would say cost is is a is a con, and um, there is a learning curve with this technology. It's not something that most of these are not just plug and play. You have to really be dedicated, or have someone on your staff that's dedicated to learning how to operate these technologies. Um, but the advantage of these is, and here's some data from a from a vegetable farm that we worked with a couple years ago is that you literally can look at real-time soil moisture sensor, uh, soil moisture, um, whether it's currently you want to look at your, your soil moisture on your phone right now, or you want to track that soil moisture for a week and then download it and look at where your soil moisture was on what day, when you decided to irrigate, was that a good decision or was it not? Um, and, and I'm showing several crops here where you, you're seeing that real-time soil moisture. Um, and then that upper red line is um, as, as soil moisture, as these bars go up, that actually means the soil is getting drier. This is soil tension. Um, that would be like the threshold you would set. And when you cross that bar, it's time to turn the sprinklers on. Um, and then at the bottom, you see where actually these, this blue, um, let me see, this is the cucumbers. This was a drip irrigation um, situation where the farmer saw this bar flatlining. And when, the, when that soil tension flatlines, at a low value, that means the soil is actually saturated. So they're losing water out of the bottom of the soil profile. They're leaching nutrients. Um, there are some downsides to that too, of course. So certainly yield impacts with over with under application of water and then some environmental and potential yield impacts with, with um, um, over application of water too. But, and that's what these, these real-time sensors can help you understand on your farm. And then my last slide, which I, I know I don't have time to talk about, but um, I just can't leave this alone given most of my works with, with soil and water is that, you know, healthy soils are really important for um, both of this too much water and too little water. Um, and these are the, you know, healthy soils really help um, build soil aggregates, help prevent the erosion that we can see with heavy storm events. Um, they build well-structured soils that act like sponges, like Christine's sponge and my sponge here that soak up water. Um, and they also help 
bridge those droughty periods. So with more organic matter in those soils, they store more water and can better help us um, kind of, you know, get from one rainfall event to the next rainfall event. And there's just so much to talk about with soils, but um, I, I wanted to focus on the, you know, kind of those um, hard infrastructure today, and then we can talk more about soils in our Q&A if we want. Um, so that's what that's what I have, and um, I think we can go ahead and transition to Q and A now. Great, thank you very much, Joshua. So, yeah, uh, any questions, comments, observations, ideas, feedback? We'll take it all. So, just before you start the Q and A, could you please uh, fill out the the evaluation for this workshop because this is really critical for us to be able to fund, you know, workshops like this. So we really need your, you know, um, input um, on the evaluation. Just, you know, it's a quick form, um, five minutes. Just open up and complete while we're talking. Okay. So any questions for, uh, we, we would just like to have that completed before we break up tonight or before you depart. So um, questions, uh, Julie had one, was the drip irrigation on plastic covered beds? Yes, yes it was. Um, okay. Um, can I ask a question about- tile? Other questions? I think was that you, Julie? Yeah, that's me again. Okay. Okay. Um, I was wondering um, if there is funding available for installing tile drainage in New England. No, no, there's not. U.S. Uh, the NRCS used to support um, that practice with with cost share and technical assistance. They they no longer do that. Um, <clears throat> it and. It, it may be the case in some other states, but in everyone I've talked to, at least Vermont and New Hampshire, there's there's no assistance there. And I would I would suspect that Massachusetts may be in the same boat given um, regional concerns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how destructive is the installation in terms of soil structure? Yeah, it, you know, it's actually it's not so bad. So um, modern contractors take what looks like a subsoil plow. It has a really narrow shank um, and there's a big spool of tile. And actually that shank just, you insert that shank behind the tractor and slides right through the ground and the spool unrolls um, and it, that shank feeds it into the ground. And there is a little bit of disturbance on the surface. I would say maybe an eight inch, you know, kind of raised area. Um, but, and most people would do that, would install tile maybe before they're about to go in with some sort of tillage operation so that they'd be smoothing things back out. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to, you know, we, we do a lot of work on the environmental impact of, of tile and I don't want to, you know, you know, say that there's, um, you know, kind of glaze over that, um, but is something that I think we hope we can address with management, kind of nutrient management, applying nutrients at the right time of the year and trying to avoid leaching of phosphorus and nitrogen into our tile lines. Thank you. Other questions and comments? I would just like to add that um, I work for NRCS, USDA, um, and we are aware that tile drainage can really assist farms. But um, our state technical committee, you can you know, present this data to them and uh, kind of make a case. I, you know, maybe you've already tried that, but uh, certainly I'm planning to talk to my you know, state about this issue. Uh, I think it just needs to be carefully considered, but um, with this data, I think that the agencies would consider uh, some tile drainage in certain situations, if presented. Um, certainly our administration is really pushing hard for climate change practices that will benefit farmers. So this might be a really good time to you know, put in a pitch for it in your state. 
Thank you very much, Helen, for that. Helen, are you talking about on an individual basis or uh, pushing for some sort of uh, change in policy on a statewide? Yeah, I'm talking about a statewide policy and you might wanna to talk to your NRCS state office about that, but on an individual basis in the field office, they don't have an opportunity to change that kind of direction. But on a, a state level, you do have that opportunity. Uh, it's through a state technical committee meeting or your conservation districts that might be able to um, influence the practices that are considered. And certainly right now, the agency is really trying to embrace more climate smart and friendly practices. So this might be a good opportunity to discuss something like this. I have to say I was a little nervous with the whole idea of tile drains, but I can see after your presentation, Joshua, what the, the value is it is for them, particularly as we're getting more and more moisture. And I'm wondering if, if writing up a little white paper about it, uh, you know, just kind of an informative thing from the side of like UMass Extension or, or you know, U, UMass and UVM Extension to put forward to that committee would, would, would help boost it a little bit. Absolutely. It definitely would. And I work with a few farmers where like, you know, my general focus is on helping them adopt um, soil health practices, but where, you know, they have a high water table. So it's like, it doesn't really matter how well you treat your soil. If it, if you're getting 70 inches of rain is going to be underwater. So yeah. there's, there's, there are certain situations where, you know, it's either that or sell that piece of land. So, and, and that brings up a whole slew of other issues. So. Yeah, we actually see where tile drainage can enable better soil management too you know, where it can then allow a farm to go in and do cover cropping because they have drier soils, they can get on the soils in the fall, or they can go in and they can do reduced tillage and conservation tillage practices. Um, so, you know, it's not clear cut in terms of the, you know, the environmental, some of the, the jury's still out on some of the environmental questions too. It reduces surface erosion, you know, because it creates more storage in the soil for the next rainstorm. Hmm. Um, and that's been well documented, um, you know, so it's, there's more research to be done, but we definitely see this from farmers that they, it's allowing them to manage their, improve their soil health. Any more questions, comments, feedback for Joshua or for Christine? Uh, I have one more question about the uh, the field tiles. Um, on a small scale, would it be feasible to do on your own if you had a tractor and a subsoiler, or is it kind of too too technical to do on your own? Yeah, I mean, it's not. Um, if you had your, um, if you wanted to do it on your own without investing in really expensive equipment, you'd probably do it with a backhoe. Um, and then your soil disturbance would be much greater. Um, it, it can be done on your own. We, we do see farmers do it, but, you know, comfort with heavy machinery and then being able to, you know, with survey equipment so that you make sure you, you maintain adequate slope on the tile so that it, it drains properly. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, gathering some more information or, um, you know, working with someone who's doing it would be a good kind of first step um, before you go and do your own. Thank you. Joshua, I'm interested in whether you're, you know, my, I have pretty limited understanding of the pre-existing drainage ditch system that used to be, um, you know, maintained often as kind of a community endeavor to maintain those drainage ditches. And, and around here, they've largely been, you know, kind of left to fill in. And I'm curious whether you're seeing sort of resurrection of those in Vermont or whether that's a system that didn't exist in Vermont or whether you've got anything to add about that. Yeah, that's, I might have, to, I don't know if Christine knows anything about that. We don't have really kind of community managed drainage ditch networks in, in Vermont where, where I am. Um, so sorry. Yeah. I don't, okay. I don't know if anyone else has any on that. 
Yeah. I don't. The example that I can think of is New Mexico, and it's a totally wildly different system, the acequias. <laughs> That's right. all I know about. Well, I think they've mostly, you know, fallen into disrepair here, but they used to be um, maintained by, often by the town or a group of farmers. So in Hatfield, they still keep, you know, like they clean, uh, you know, every other year they, they, they do like a map and they do clean. So I saw um, Riqueza del Campo, they do have ditches and they were cleaned like three years ago or something like that. I mean, what a great community activity to, you know, meet your buddy farmer, your neighbor farmers and help maintain them. I like it. Hang, hang out in the ditch for a while. Right. <laughs> Okay, everybody, well, we just have a few minutes left here and I do wanna make sure you have time to fill out our evaluation form. The questions, there's general questions and then specific questions about the climate program and some things that uh, you might be interested in learning more about. So please, uh, if you could take a few minutes uh, to do that before we, before we uh, split up, that would be great. And I wanna thank Joshua and Christine again for joining us. I think this is a great kickoff for our series. And it's also, again, part of a bigger process to start building community between universities and farmers and NGOs and the state uh, that we really need to be uh, aware of that process in addition to the hard skills that we all need. So uh, I hope to see all of you at these events and at others going forward. Thank you very much. And uh, oh, it's please. It's my pleasure, uh, Stephen. Thanks so much for inviting us. I really appreciate it. And if you, if there's a way that you can make our slides available, I'm happy to have those available to folks who came tonight. So anybody who uh, who you want to give those to, that's fine with me. Okay. Thank we, you very we, much. We can PDF and send it to them through email. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your evening and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night everyone. Nice to see you, Sue. I will respond to your email soon. I can't hear you, uh, Sue. And Zach, nice to see you too, if you're there. I know you had some troubles getting in maybe. Hi, Stephen. Yeah, I, I, I had a little bit of technical dif difficulty, but it was a really great uh, session, very useful.